Ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> your attention please. I am Anna Colomar O'Brien, Chief of Protocol of the Organization of American States. I would like to recognize, before we begin with the program, our honored guest, Sir Sridhar Rampa, former Secretary General of the Commonwealth and Minister of Foreign Affairs of Guyana. Of course, Ambassador Albert Randim, Assistant Secretary General. Sir George Eileen, Chancellor, University of the West Indies, permanent representatives to the OAS and permanent observers, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. We are pleased to welcome you to the House of the Americas and to this 58th lecture series to launch Sir Chidrat Rampal's memoir, Glimpses of a Global Life. This event is jointly organized by the Office of the Assistant Secretary General and the Department of International Affairs in the Secretariat of External Relations. We extend our greetings to our sponsor, Universidad de San Martín de Porras in Lima, Peru, and to the audience following via internet. We remind our public that this event is transmitted both in English and Spanish, and the equipment for the translation is available in the back of the hall. It is my pleasure now to invite Ambassador Albert Ramdin, Assistant Secretary General to the Organization of American States to come to the podium to inaugurate this event. Ambassador, please. I have this good morning. It's not a very strong good morning here, but okay, I'll take it. Good morning. Excellent. So Sridhar Surindranath Ramphal, it's a great honor for me to welcome you to the Organization of American States on behalf of Secretary General Jose Miguel Insulza. To this, the oldest regional political organization in the world and the principal vehicle for multilateral diplomacy in the Americas. The chair of the Permanent Council, Ambassador Lasilia Prince of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. The chair of the Inter-American Council for Integral Development, Ambassador Neil Fashion of Trinidad and Tobago. Sir George Aline and Mrs. Aline, former Assistant Secretary General and Acting Secretary General, Ambassador Luigi Enaudi the Dean of the Corps of Permanent Representative to the Organization, Ambassador Benny Karan, distinguished permanent representatives, members of the Diplomatic Corps, delegates, specially invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, members of the Caribbean diaspora as well. The Organization of American States welcomes you to the Hall of the Americas to launch the memoirs of Sir Sridhar Ramphal, titled Glimpse glimpses of a global life. The OAS is pleased to be part of the Washington DC launch of this long-awaited publication. Sir Sridhar Ramphal requires very little introduction. In fact, I cannot remember a time when I did not know the name Sonny Ramphal. His is indeed a global life, marked with national, regional, and international milestones. An international diplomat, lawyer, former Attorney General, and Foreign Minister. He went on to lead the Commonwealth of Nations in its crucial years. His memoirs, ladies and gentlemen, is laid out carefully and with humility. To me, it's not just a memoir with personal insights. It's also a commentary and an insider's perspective on pivotal events which, which have shaped the world and our own Caribbean. The impact of Sir Sridhar Ramphal on our world history is real. He is not only the Caribbean man who prioritized regionalism, he is the man who stood shoulder to shoulder with world leaders debating and guiding matters of foreign affairs and diplomatic relations. The man who shaped the modern commonwealth of nations by having a concrete impact on issues of apartheid, 
world trade and intervening with when either quiet diplomacy or open conflict resolution were needed. Nelson Mandela himself once said this of our guest today, and I quote, some men have become famous because of the service they have given to the countries. Others have become well known because of the manner in which they have taken up issues affecting their regions. And others have become famous because in their fight for human justice, they have chosen the entire world as their theater. Sridhar Ramphal is one of those men. That is what Nelson Mandela said about so Sridhar. As you can see by the thickness of the book, the memoir is sorrow. At the same time, it's a diplomatic, it's diplomatic enough to give us an idea of the reality behind some of the most public challenges in the world history. These are striking similarities and parallels faced by our organizations. And the lessons and perspectives contained in this book are noteworthy and greatly appreciated. Today, Secretary General Sousa and I are pleased to welcome you all to the OAS to launch Glimpses of a Global Life, a memoir by Sir Sridhar Ramphal. I now invite someone who can speak about the person and the professional, Sridhar Ramphal, with authority. I invite to the podium Sir George Aline, Chancellor of the University of the West Indies and former director of the Pan American Health Organization and a longtime friend and colleague of Sir Sridhar to address you. Sir George. Mr. Assistant Secretary General, Mr. Shrida, distinguished colleagues of all ages, ladies and gentlemen, let me thank you, Ambassador Ramdin, for launching Mr. Shrida's book in this historic and most appropriate setting. In this place whose walls over the years have listened to many of the wise and famous espousing many of the same tenets and principles which he has been, with which he has been associated over a long and productive public life. I was honored, and I must confess, rather flattered to receive Sonny's email asking me to speak at the launch of his book. But I admit to some disquiet at reading the opening words of the email. It began, dear champ, my writing is done. I merely uttered a, a, a silent prayer that he did not really mean this, but it was an affirmation that he would not attempt such a monumental opus again. Not that his speeches and writings would be less valuable, but perhaps they'd be shorter and more pointed. But then I was encouraged by the title of the book, Glimpses of a Global Life, as it comforted me with the belief that these glimpses would be supplemented by him and others in the fullness of time with more than a glimpse, but a wider view through the other casements that have been left closed. The old cliche that this book was hard to put down is in this instance very true. And the lucid description of the critical events of our time in and beyond the Caribbean, the personal reflections about himself and his family, the explosion of some of the myths of the professional spinners make this truly a work for the ages. Obviously, I can't describe the whole book but I'll try to say how I see Sonny as a person and as a professional through the various parts of it which found loudest echo with me. And one of the, for me, the most lasting impressions of the book is sheer wonder at the pure artistry with which Sonny introduces and elaborates in so many places one of those concepts that is clearly for him a commandment and a canon of faith. With pointillistic precision, he identifies the commonality of our origins, the common responsibility for this shared earthly home, the sameness of the shackles that make it a disgrace to engage in the politics of race in the Caribbean or anywhere, and not hear the constancy of his cry for an end to otherness. And all of this comes to my mind frequently as I say some of the words of one of our Caribbean national anthems that plead for every creed and race to find an equal place. But to the beginning, everyone here must know that Sridhar Ramphal was born in then British Guyana 
and he can trace his roots back from there across the ocean to Bihar in India. But his trunk is solidly Caribbean. His branches spread all over the world, and there is testimony of the value of the fruits of those branches from wherever he has set foot or given voice. And these fruits were sometimes bitter to the taste of those who opposed his principles, but were sweet to the many who worked with him to breach the ramparts of some of the most egregious, oppressive, and discriminating uh, regimes the world has ever seen. It would be an error to read this book simply as a historical account of the local, regional, and global politics between 1928 and, and 2012. There will always be many who can dip into the archives and produce a bare historical chronicle. One has to see this book as a tapestry of the life and times of a remarkable individual, whom I'm sure will probably take issue or even umbrage at that designation, and plead that there was some talent, yes, but also a large dollop of luck and the fortune to have competent support when it was needed. I've sometimes wondered whether Sonny did not think that his development was somewhat precocious. His rise to prominence nationally and regionally was nothing short of meteoric. At the relatively tender age of 30, when we think of most lawyers lit literally just beginning to understand the nicety of tort laws, there he was, realizing a dream which began some eight years previously in the London School of Economics, and it was there at, the, at a lunch seminar, he had an epiphany. As he listened to Norman Manley outline the vision of a West Indian nation, and as it were, the scales fell from his eyes, and he would see clearly what the West Indies was all about, and he would see clearly the role that he could play. There he was in 1958, helping to write the Constitution of West Indies Federation, and here I must point out especially to the young, a message that he transmits with pellucid clarity on more than one occasion, and against which there has been no argument. And he points out how the promise of federation for most Caribbean politicians was that it would speed up and facilitate achievement of individual local political control. But that was not to be. And with federation in place, the Caribbean barrel resonated with the scratches of the crumbling crustacean claws. And before the age of 40, there he was again, with his heart and hands still bleeding from the hands of the shattered, from, still bleeding from the shards of the shattered federation, and bending his talents to the task of assisting in creating another union, this time in Dickinson Bay. As he describes it, a pebble fell in the Caribbean, and the ripples of it reached shores across the archipelago, their sweep strengthened by the currents that were flowing. Sonny tries to explain, but for me is still a perfect ponder, why Burnham, like Achilles, lingered in his tent while the battle for survival of the Federation swirled about him, and then was sally forth at Dickinson's Bay as a committed regionist to form Carifesta. And Sonny was there again at Chagaramas, having helped to, to nurse the mewling infant of Corifta to become the adolescent Caricon. And he would be an important architect in helping to fashion the treaty, which he and others hoped would be the cornerstone upon which a new West Indies would arise, much taller, much wider, much deeper, and perhaps more beautiful and more permanent than the previous ones. But then he left another place, leaving strict injunctions to his colleagues to care for CARICOM, at least it was still not yet an adult. He left to fashion a better world for more than just the Caribbean. And if it was in the Caribbean that he achieved legendary status even as a very young man, it was from his work in Marlborough House that his status as a formidable global actor became genuinely iconic. We have glimpses of how as a second Secretary General of the Commonwealth, he would make that organization worthy of the function intrinsic to his name, improving the common wheel. And the book describes the multiple initiatives that he undertook, initiatives that made the organization respected as a leader in many facets of international affairs. The 13 expert groups which he convened produced a corpus of work that was at the forefront of, and in some instances, led global thinking. I've tried to find some commonality, some golden thread that links these diverse initiatives. 
I have come to the conclusion that Sunny was one of the early few who properly conceptualized what is the meaning of true human development and how it should be sustained. And when one analyzes the work of the five commissions of which he was an active member, one can discern quite clearly the preeminence of the anthropocentric view. Development is about man. As I'm fond of quoting Eric Williams saying, development is the face of man. It will only be achieved and sustained when you recognize the imperatives of the thematic and geographical interdependence, as Sonny has so often stressed. And these accomplishments, which are only sketched in the book, are the more remarkable when one knows the resources at the disposal of the Secretariat. And these accomplishments are undoubtedly due to the power and salience of ideas, the capacity to articulate them, the relevance of the problems at hand, and trust in the leadership that wrought the changes, a leadership that was as transformative as it was indefatigable. Sonny mentions that he gave 480 speeches on apartheid and sanctions during the decade of the 80s. And I hope it is not uncharitable to say, O oh, tempera, O oh, mores. No reading of the book and no mining of the role Sonny and the Commonwealth played on the international scene can fail to recognize what must be one of the crowning achievements of that organization. South Africa had established one of the most brutal forms of de facto slavery of the 20th century. Some of this I would experience vicariously as I wept silently on seeing the memorabilia and the nooses swinging from the ceiling in the apartheid museum in Johannesburg. And more than thrice had several legions marched around the walls with nary a crack. Or if there were cracks, they were plastered over by the devious efforts of kith and kin of the North and West. But as by dint of personal persuasion, consummate diplomacy, mobilization of the committed willing, a fierce and unswerving commitment to sanctions, and the deployment of strategic efforts such as the eminent persons group, that eventually the walls would come tumbling down, and many more beside Mandela would see the possibility of a march, of walking to freedom. And the world recognized and lauded the primacy of the Commonwealth effort, the primacy of the role of its Secretary General, Sonny Ramphal. And then he left the Commonwealth. And one of the most pleasing images that the book conjures up to me is of Sonny departing the list to a paean of grateful cheers with Margaret Thatcher and Peter Carrington lowering their lances, lowering their broken lances and offering congratulations. And the lady would thank and co congratulate him for what he had done for the Commonwealth and declare that he would, would be a hard act to follow. And Sonny would graciously acknowledge the congratulations. So now on to the post-Commonwealth and back to the Caribbean. The flame had flickered, and Erna Robertson of Trinidad and Tobago tried to fan it again at Grand Dance. And we saw some renaissance of the spirit to try once again to move the West Indies forward, and another clear call for Sonny Ramphal to help. And it appeared that there was indeed a Mali-like natural mystic through it, flowing through the air. And his West Indian Commission and his report, A Time for Action, outlined the path to be followed. I can't detail the recipe set out here to put the region on a path that would have it recapture its pristine promise of one West Indies. But let me cite one of the more moving passages from the foreword that Sonny himself wrote. He said, I am the fourth generation of my family's anguish transplantation. Other West Indies have been here, other West Indians have been here over a long period and through systems of greater anguish. Yet, it was natural for me to remind an audience during the Commission's consultations, I am Guyanese before I'm Indian. I am West Indian before I'm Guyanese. Oneness had replaced separateness and four generations. And so it is. For most of the people of our CACOM region, that oneness is the basic reality of our West Indian condition. So against this background, in this context, as West Indians must understand Sonny's often pointed and sharp but never personal comments about the failure to take up the Commission's recommendations, which seemed so eminently feasible but would be obfuscated by the tactics of dawdle and delay. But the image I'd like to conjure up now is of Sonny constantly engaged in the struggle, hopefully not Sisyphean, to perfect the union 
and perhaps like a Moses or Martin Luther King, looking at a vision of the promised land with a conviction and assurance that one day it will be ours to inhabit. So he must be persistent and encourage others to persist in trying to perfect the union, to fan the regional flame, and profess that West Indian faith to which he has dedicated so much of this life. I apologize to those of you who think I have been unduly selective in my references to part of Sunday's life and work. In the time I had, I couldn't do just to his origins, his and Guyana's seminal role in the non-aligned movement, the conceptualization of the new international economic order, his negotiation of the ACP-EU Lome Agreement, a monumental achievement if I may say so, his comments on the Grenada invasion, and I'm most culpable, of course, in not commenting on his 14 years as Chancellor of our University of the West Indies and my personal satisfaction of having him as my predecessor. And I trust that these omissions be additional inducement for you to buy this book. Mr. Ambassador, our family home in St. Philip Barbados had what seemed to me as a little boy a very long veranda. And I have a very vivid memories of my father a school teacher like Sonny is pacing up and down that veranda at night, declaiming many of Shakespeare's lines, some of which I recall, many of which I've forgotten. But one of those I recall more clearly is from King Henry's speech before the Battle of Agincourt, and this part in particular. He says, it yearns me not if men my garments wear. Such outward things dwell not in my desires. But if it be a sin to covet honor, I am the most offending man alive. It is palpably clear from this book that Sonny Ramphal did not and does not covet, covet fame or honor. Such honors as have been rightly bestowed on him came with the affirmation of the givers that they have not been sought, have been freely offered, and are richly deserved. But if to live a life dedicated to the improvement of man globally is a sin, if commitment to justice, equity, and the bare essentials of decency is a sin, if fierce adherence to and profession of the concept that fundamentally there are no others and we are all heirs to the same inheritance is a sin, if critical comment of those who would exchange the birthright of West Indian unity for the pottage of parochial power is a sin, if the gift of eloquence and the mastery of words for good purpose are a sin, then of a truth, Sonny Ramphal is one of the most offending men alive. But I'm sure that we, and many will read, who have read his book, will be happy to give him absolution. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sir George, for that salute to the life and work of Sir Sonny uh, Ramphal. It's my pleasure now to invite Sir Shriad Ramphal to the podium to read, but also to make his own remarks before we enter into a conversation with you as well. Sir Shriad, you have the floor. Assistant Secretary General Albert Bramden, Chancellor of the University of the West Indies, Excellencies, friends, all of you, thank you, thank you for coming. Launches are not occasions for authors to speak. The book has spoken for them, for me. Yet, a few things remain. 
and some bear repetition. For this occasion itself, in this hemispheric place, I thank Secretary General Insulza and Assistant Secretary General Ramden for making the launch possible. There could be no better place in this city to be invited to do so. This center of much of my global life to which the book speaks. I'm especially grateful to ASG Ramden for the assistance he gave in making this occasion possible and for his insistence that the process of launching the book should go forth from here. And so too to the ASG's staff who did so much to help him fulfill his promises. There are very many benefactors who I have acknowledged in the book and will not do so again here, save two. My daughter, Susan, and her husband, Sir Ronald Sanders. Without them, and rather especially without Ron, although they would both deny this, I could not have launched this memoir now. But very special to this occasion, my gratitude is to the Chancellor of the University of the West Indies, Sir George. Gratitude to him for his presence here today and the generous words he has spoken. I know that he has just endured the joyous but Herculean task of innumerable convocations on the campuses of his archipelagic university. It is generous beyond words that he has spoken here. I am deeply grateful, Sir George. Having said thanks, let me say a word of apology. There is so much more that I could have written about. So many others who shared my global journeys that I could have written of. Alas, it would take another book to do so. It must suffice for me to plead that these are glimpses only, and to hope that in their own way they will help to conjure up, especially for those who share them, some of what is left out. Let me end this opening with sharing a few short passages with you as the program dictates. Authors are not expected to start their writings save with words taken from others that adorn what are called the book's flyleaf. I chose two quotations, and I will read them for you, because if only subliminally, 
They influence the writing. The first is from Gabriel, Marque, Gabriel Garcia Marquez. As I explained, born up the South American coast, to the west of Guyana, the year before I was born. What he wrote was this, what matters in life is not what happens to you, but what do you remember and how you remember it. The second is from a Guyanese playwright, Michael Jirks, who in a poem wrote, old men should write, not the young in their prime. Their pasts are too shallow to enfranchise them. Just so they write of lasting things, not whine about love's fleeting red-nosed border hem. They both encouraged me. And now for the substantive passengers from the book itself. My first passage has shades of this hemisphere itself. It is from chapter 18, which is called Leading a Wider Unity. And it is this. A small episode in 1974 in the area of U.S. Latin American relations reaffirmed for me that small states without conventional power, that four small states without conventional power, principle offers diplomatic clout and earns respect. This 1972 action with which I had been so closely involved of breaking the diplomatic exchange embargo against Cuba through joint action by Barbados, Guyana, Jamaica, and Trinidad and Tobago, had lifted the self-esteem of West Indies, not as an ideological statement, but as an independent stand on the side of justice, American anguish notwithstanding. Two years later, I was involved in another such assertion of universal values at the conference of Tlatelolco in Mexico in 1974. Just a few of you here may remember it. It was a time of Henry Kissinger's ascendancy in world affairs. And he had chosen a meeting of Latin American foreign ministers to unveil and secure approval of a scheme for what he called a community of the Western Hemisphere. He had apparently squared the proposal with his host foreign minister, the foreign minister of, of Mexico, Emilio Oscar Rabasa Mishkin. But he had squared it with no one else. I represented Guyana, and Foreign Minister Dudley Thompson of Jamaica was with me. 
Kissinger spoke at the public meeting opening the conference and announced his proposal. Of course, announced it in the name of the United States. Dudley Thompson was a rather blunt and fearless foreign minister. who was a young lawyer, had been on Jomo Kenyatta's legal defense team in Kenya during the Mau Mau period. He and I were equally troubled by Kissinger's proposal and established at the manner, and, and astonished at the manner of the presentation of the, for decision. To make matters worse, Canada, to whom we were very close, was not then a member of the Latin American family and was not therefore at the meeting or within the compass of the proposals. And Cuba, of course, was neither there nor did the US intend it to be in the community. When the matter came to the floor for discussion in closed session, I was surprised by the lack of Latin American complaint. Apart from Thompson and me, the only other strong objection came from the Venezuelan counterpart, Aristides Calvani. I spoke in a fashion Kissinger had to respect, making the case that the community of the Western Hemisphere was not at all. Since in an association of such, since an association of such unequals, community would inevitably mean hegemony. Moreover, I objected to the exclusion of Canada and Cuba. I drew again on Aristotle's ethics, which totally astonished Kissinger. Dudley Thompson followed rather the same line, but more robustly. You will forgive me, but the light is not very good here. And he was particularly trenchant over the exclusion of Cuba, treating Cuba as a four-letter word was the way he admonished Kissinger. When we were finished, Kissinger, visibly surprised, asked for an adjournment. And he sought out Dudley and me in the coffee room, asking without rancor and in his rather bluff way, who the hell are you? <laughs> I thought I was coming here to meet a bunch of Spaniards. And you turn up. I'm going to withdraw the proposal. And on the resumption, that is exactly what he did. Rabasa, Michigan, was crestfallen, but I believe that most Latin American ministers were relieved that we had belled the cat. In the third volume of his memoirs, Years of Renewal, writing of that Tlatelolco conference, Kissinger wrote this, I had perhaps 
use too grandiloquent a phrase for what was really a system of closer Western Hemisphere cooperation. And he acknowledged that what troubled them, the Latin American foreign ministers, was the concept of community. Clearly, they feared that the United States had found a new formula for its traditional hegemonic aspiration. End of quote. It was a gracious withdrawal. But there was more. In con concluding his account of the Tlatelolco meeting, Kissinger wrote in that book, Gibson Barbosa, the foreign minister of Brazil, proposed that the English-speaking members of the conference try their hand at an alternative community, and that Foreign Minister Ramphal of Guyana and I, Kissinger, served on the drafting committee. And he continued, it was an extraordinary proposition. Guyana was invariably on the side of the radicals in third world forums. Like all, like, like all successor states of Europe, Caribbean possessions, it was not part of the historic inter-American system and was not even a member of the OAS. Tlatelolco was, in fact, the first meeting of Western Hemisphere foreign ministers to which Ramphal had been invited. On the other hand, Guyana had border disputes with Venezuela, with respect to which the United States' goodwill might prove useful. Above all, Ramphal, whose command of English was awe-inspiring, and who was as charming as he was eloquent, hugely enjoyed his pivotal role. In the end, I managed to produce a draft more compatible with the original intention of the new dialogue." End of quote. Later, when I saw the UN Secretary General Kurt Waldheim at the meeting of the UN General Assembly that followed Tlatelolco closely. He told me that Kissinger had recounted the episode to him and told him not to tangle with Ramaphal. Although, altogether, it was good for Caribbean self-confidence, and it was good for our standing in Latin America that we had taken him on. That is the end of my first passage. My second is rather shorter and very close to, the, to this city itself. It is this, from chapter 17. Chapter 17 is entitled The Brandt Commission. We were not without varied perceptions even among members of the Commission. When first I spoke in the Commission, outlining my view of the disparities of wealth and poverty in the world, a commissioner, a fellow commissioner, spoke quietly to a staff member of the Commission 
saying that she had not before heard a communist speak. She was told that Sonny Ramphill is rather is regarded in the developing world as a moderate. He is not a communist. She was Catherine Graham, the owner of the Washington Post and a rather sophisticated modern woman. But such talk was entirely outside her ken. She would discover reality in the course of the Commission's work, and she would become a valued member of the Commission. But such was the gap in perception outside one's cloistered circle. And it was so, of course, in much of the world. Catherine Graham and I were to have another interesting encounter while we served on the Commission. Although it was one that had nothing to do with the Commission or its work. Her commission meetings were, were held all around the world. After the opening session in Germany, we met in many other places, and one of them was in Kuala Lumpur. And en route, we had a roundtable meeting in New Delhi. On the 19th of November, an agitated K. Graham hailed me on the steps of the Ashoka Hotel in New Delhi, where we were staying. Her Washington Post editor had called to tell her of mass suicides at Jonestown in Guyana on the 18th of November and to urge her to make the most of my presence in New Delhi to illumine the story. I was slightly ashamed to tell her that I had never heard of Jonestown or of such a settlement anywhere in Guyana. I ventured a wild guess that it might be far down in the south near Brazil. I was not sure what Mrs. Graham told her editor. Jonestown turned out to be in the furthest northwest of the country, near Venezuela. I took comfort in my ignorance, which as it turned out was shared by the vast majority of the people of Guyana, who had no idea that Jonestown existed or of the American who formed and led its bizarre settlement, or of the weird man who headed it. That is my second passage. My third is rather different. And it is entitled, Internationalizing the Club. In March 1975, within months of assuming office, I discovered, I discussed with Commonwealth permanent representatives at UN headquarters, the idea of formal observer status for the Commonwealth, sec the Commonwealth Secretariat, 
at the General Assembly. This would be symbolic of our internationalism. But on a more practical level, it would give the, the Secretariat an entitlement to all the documents of the Assembly and to be represented in an in observer capacity at all meetings of the Assembly. The idea was warmly welcomed. In 1957, I was pleased to have attestation of this from a dispassionate source a source beyond the Commonwealth. In that year, the West German president, Richard von Weizsäcker, on a state visit to Britain, had this to say about the Commonwealth. The Commonwealth is not against anyone. It is a source of common service and of common sense in the world where, there, where that quality is sadly lacking. It cannot negotiate on behalf of the world, but it can caution the world and can help the world to negotiate. The more the Commonwealth preserves its cohesive nature across the oceans and the continents, the better for all, including our own community. This was not a small endorsement of the Commonwealth. It had significance beyond itself. And all the Commonwealth was proved to be so perceived. But there is such a thing as throwing out the baby with the bathwater. And that is the risk when we discard entirely the notion of the Commonwealth Club. In January 1947, 1987, I found myself speaking in Toronto to the Empire Club of Canada. My hosts were not throwbacks to earlier times. I was sure that the club, that the club's name in no way inspired veneration of things imperial. Like the Commonwealth, the club did emerge from empire. And like the Commonwealth itself, it did not disown those beginnings. But both, like a butterfly, adorn the present because of a past transformed. An empire, I realize, had another connotation, which belongs to all time, the connotation of worthy ambitions, not for dominion over others, but for outreach toward them. When I came to the Commonwealth in 1975, I confess to an aversion to the very notion of the Commonwealth as a club. For my connotations were all of the negative kind. I found, however, that these were part of the Commonwealth, 
that there were parts of the Commonwealth where they were more enlightened than I was, and nowhere more so than in Africa. On my first visit to Tanzania, in my earlier years, I was astonished to find the Commonwealth referred to extensively in the media as a Commonwealth club, or more simply, as the club. The Tanzania Daily News of the 24th of June 1975, for example, had carried the story of my appointment to the office with the headline, in, in very bold letters, Club. Mr. Ramphal takes over in, 90, in July. And always, as in this case, the consideration was positive. Our club, which must certainly do better, but our club. It was an image of a club not to be discovered but, and, and discarded, but to be made to perform better, because it was ours. And I came to realize that in that positive connotation lay a Commonwealth asset, an asset of belonging to something new and something whole. There was, that was a decision of long-term significance for the world. The ways the Commonwealth could serve this international community was the memory, for, for neither member states like Tanzania and leaders like Julius Nereri to struggle within the Commonwealth on global issues, taking advantage of the unique opportunities for the forging of consensus that the Commonwealth offered. Sometimes, as on Southern Africa issues, such struggles would be grim. But as we shall see, they would lead in only one direction. On some matters, such struggles could only take place within the Commonwealth. And the international community knew that this was so. Small wonder that President von Weizsäcker, drawing on words I had myself earlier used, acknowledged that while the Commonwealth cannot negotiate for the world, it could help the world to negotiate. And my final passage. It's taken from the near final chapter, 24, entitled Mandela's Freedom. And it is this. Margaret Thatcher could barely wait for Mandela's release before proclaiming the lifting of such limited sanctions as she had imposed, and calling on the international community to do likewise. This had been her deal with the clerk. Mandela was livid. 
A few days before his meeting in Abuja, he had said, only the unserious and people not involved in the South African quest for freedom would call for lifting of sanctions. If sanctions are, revived, are reviewed, the government would be encouraged to assert its position on apartheid. In Abuja, he had spoken more bluntly. We would like to point out that we are, to put it mildly, amazed at the behavior of certain countries following the unbanning of the ANC and other organizations on the 2nd of February 1990. I refer to the stand taken by the British government to lift sanctions against the government of South Africa and to call it on other governments to do so. There are no grounds, no grounds whatever, for lifting sanctions against the racist regime in South Africa or in ending in diplomatic and cultural isolation. The call for the lifting of sanctions is a dangerous trend. If the trend is not stopped, all our gains can be reversed. The matter was so serious that besides that before leaving Nigeria, I wrote an op-ed piece for the International Herald Tribune from Lagos itself, elucidating Mandela's plea and the conclusion of the Commonwealth Committee of Foreign Ministers that the time for the ending of sanctions had not arrived. To reduce pressure, they had said, before any changes of substance have occurred, would be to run the risk of aborting the process of ending racism. It was published on the 30th of May under the headline, South Africans Need Sanctions. It happened to be my last published piece as Secretary General. At the end of June, I demitted office. 24 years after that, on the 3rd of March this year, 2014, I was reminded of the obtuseness of the British and American governments in the address given by the then Archbishop Emeritus of Cape Town, the Most Reverend Desmond Tutu, in Westminster Abbey. It was a most splendid and unique service of thanksgiving for the life and work of Nelson Mandela. Held, as the Dean of Westminster said, in the name of the people of South Africa, of the United Kingdom, and of the Commonwealth. I was privileged to be there in that place of honor with my granddaughter. Desmond Tutu was characteristically gracious, but he specifically recalled, even in that moment of atonement, the following. What would have happened had Mandela died in prison? As was the intended hope of the upholders of apartheid. 
I suppose most would have regarded him as no better than a terrorist. Persons in high positions in Britain and the US did dismiss him as such. Mercifully for us and God's world, Mandela did not die in prison. And this is due very largely to the amazing anti-apartheid movement. I use this great pulpit, he said, to say on behalf of our people, thank you, thank you, thank you. I visited number 10 Downing Street and the Oval Office in Washington. My pleas for sanctions to continue fell on deaf ears. Without the anti-apartheid movement, Nelson Mandela would so easily have died in prison. And I continue. So much of my own Commonwealth life had been spent in the anti-apartheid cause. It was a thank you from Tutu himself such an ineffable source, which I appropriated to the Commonwealth as well. And on that day of thanksgiving for Mandela's life, I reflected on how much more we might have achieved in the Commonwealth had Margaret Thatcher carried over to South Africa and to apartheid, the commitment to black majority rule that had made the ending of UDI in southern Rhodesia possible at Lusaka in 1979. Nelson Mandela, in my personal view, could have been freed from apartheid prisoners as much as five years earlier than he was. What would that have meant for him? What would it have meant for South Africa? What would it have meant for the world? I depart from the book to tell you this. Immediately after that service, I wrote Desmond Tutu in Pretoria to say how wonderful he had been in the Abbey. His reply came a little too late to be included in the book, but I share it with you here. For I think it was meant for lots of you. My dear Sonny, he wrote, how good to be in touch with you, recalling all those days when you were such a fantastic supporter of our anti-apartheid struggle, helping to give it respectability by inviting the likes of Oliver Tambo to Commonwealth functions where the head of the Commonwealth was to be present, as well as members of a government whose members thought the ANC was a terrorist organization. Thank you. Thank you so very much for all that. How I long to see you just to thank you in person. Much love, gratitude, and blessings. And he signed it, Arch. You see why I said, 
I feel it was intended for lots of you as well. Thank you all for being with me today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please stay for a minute because it's not over. We will have the opportunity to exchange for a, for a dialogue with Sridhar on issues which are relevant to you as well. We have heard so much, and there are a couple of issues which I'm sure you would want to raise with him or get his perspectives on. So bear with us for a minute. Thank you. Great. Um, Thank you very much for um, those words, Sridhar, and I think a lot of history, a lot of important events globally. The world is in a different situation today than it was maybe 30 years ago. Still many challenges, flux of changes taking place, and at the same time, many don't know where we are heading. So maybe time for another global commission to deal with issues. So Sridhar has been member of all the global commissions which were uh, established by the United Nations, and, and I believe the only person to be in that capacity, um, dealing with apartheid and other issues, the development of the world. I wanted, I have some questions for myself, but I wanted to uh, provide the opportunity to the audience to ask questions or to raise some issues which Sir Shuriat can give a perspective on. Um, anyone wants to start? Ambassador Luigi Enaudi. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a privilege to be here again in the presence of uh, a great international servant. Uh, I was present uh, when um, the then Foreign Minister of Guyana took on the Secretary of State of the United States. Um, I was uh, sitting uh, with Henry Kissinger uh, when um, Sonny Ramphal uh, cited Aristotle uh, and used Aristotle uh, to explain that community among unequals uh, is impossible. Uh, I would like to make two or three quick comments on that. First of all, everything that is in the book about this is correct. Um, uh, as they say, an eyewitness support. The second point is that um, the reason Henry Kissinger remembered uh, Sonny Ramphal, and not, for that matter, Dudley Thompson, or any of the Latin Americans, some of whom were uh, also resistant uh, or amused at the American change of language uh, that Kissinger represented at that moment, at that meeting. Um, I'm sorry, I'm getting older and I've just lost the thread. Um, yes, the reason he remembered Ramphal was that Ramphal did not take him on with four-letter words. Ramphal took him on intellectually with concepts and in doing so demonstrated one of the great strengths of the Caribbean. Uh, the pleasure this morning of listening to my friend Sir George Elaine quote Shakespeare. It is possible to come from the Caribbean and project a sense of universalism 
that we Anglo-Americans can recognize and respect. Uh, and I think that I would also add one final thought here. Uh, it is that when we are so bearded, it has to be carefully done. I remember one Caribbean talking to another American Secretary of State uh, and referring to man's uh, injustice to man, which is Bobby Burns, but the American thought it was Karl Marx. Um, so one has to be careful, but if one is also um, intelligent and precise and intellectual, it is possible to have an impact. And one of the things that you did not mention, sir, that was the consequence of your standing up to Henry Kissinger is that he came back to Washington and he reorganized the State Department um, with a program called GLOP, uh, Global Outlook Program, because he felt that his Foreign Service had failed him and had not had the outlook to prepare him to face you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, um, Ambassador Inaudi. Maybe time for a little bit of a revision and addition to the book on, on this account, <laughs> um, because it apparently had impact on the operations within State Department. Um, other questions? In the meantime, I, I wanted to pose a question as, we, as it relates to Caribbean diplomacy. So, Sridhar, you have spoken much about the Caribbean and the strengths of the Caribbean as a group of small nations, but capable of doing much more. Now, you have also been very lucid and often critical about the state of the integration process and the regionalism within the Caribbean. What's your view on it if you look at what is the current status of Caribbean integration and how we need to project ourselves in the world? You mean of Caribbean regionalism today? Today. Well, I despair, quite frankly, uh, and I say that in this family. Um, we have had our ups and downs in the Caribbean. We have had the high moments when the federal dream possessed us all, as youngsters, as leaders. And then we lost the dream. And we found it again in the revival of regionalism through Carifta and then CARICOM. And for a while, as a Caribbean community, we began to find the strengths that always lie within a community of equals. And then it disappeared. We, we became fashionable in the sense of believing in sovereignty, which of course has great traditional intellectual moorings, but lost our pragmatism in believing that sovereignty was for us as small countries in a world where even large countries were joining to enhance their strengths. And that possesses us still. Uh, so the problem that faces the Caribbean today is one which has to be rectified by another generation. Because I believe the present political leadership, and I'm conscious that I speak in the presence of representatives of governments of the Caribbean, the present political leadership has failed us. And in a universal way, there was a time in the Caribbean when perhaps one or two, two or three, three or four, 
of the leaders would carry the ball and sustain the, the, a passion for regionalism. There is not one today that carries that passion in a way that can infuse the whole region. So that a time when the world is coming together all over the world, the Caribbean is falling apart. Choosing alliances wherever they seem to offer benefit, profit, ignoring the larger gains to be made in unity and solidarity. I personally believe that that is bad. I have believed it all my life. I have believed it all through the ups and downs. And here and there, I had an opportunity to contribute to the uprise of the mood. Others have to take it on now. Because I have no doubt whatsoever in my mind that the future of the Caribbean lies in its unity. And therefore, if the present leadership does not offer it, the next leadership must. And the younger people of the Caribbean, the social media in the Caribbean, uh, who I believe share that sentiment, must come to the fore increasingly and make it happen. Thank you very much. I, I, I raise this issue because I raise this issue because when you spoke about the clout small Caribbean countries can bring to global issues because of not only or because of the absence of conventional power, but also because of the moral high ground we bring to issues um, within the organization of American states, the Caribbean together with small states in Central America represents 75% of membership that should give enough clout to to project itself as a, as a strong player. But it also answers the question which you raised in the book itself, where the Honorable Prime Minister, the former Honorable Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago, Eric Williams, stated, and I quote when you said, have we rectified our disgraceful state of fragmentation? And that is what you have alluded to at this point in time. So certainly a message for all of us to get back on track and towards unity and strength. The floor is, remains open. Um, Ambassador Nuri from the Bahamas. Thank you very much, uh, Sri Rat. I'm from the Bahamas and I met you in London many long years ago and you've been saying the same thing about Caribbean unity. I'd like to just add one other point to reinforce what you were saying. What, it strikes me um, as a long, lifelong student of the Caribbean and the unity that is necessary that we often leave out, we the Caribbean peoples, the sense of unity at the level of financial cooperation. It seems that we always look, even here in Washington and elsewhere, we tend often to look out for somebody else in a, what I call a mendicant posture. We're always asking other people for things which we need to begin ourselves. I use, I've come up with an expression, you'll hear it again, I'm sure, called carry lateralism which means literally what it says. We talk about bilateralism, multilateralism, but we never seem to talk about carrilateralism except at the administrative level of Georgetown. What do I mean by that? I take a simple example, and it's one that I think is worthy of consideration. That is, where I live in the Bahamas, there are 400,000 people, and if we took one dollar from each person per day in an investment mode, not in a charity mode. You're talking about collecting in that small, small in the sense of population, 
400,000 US dollars a day, or $146 million from 400,000 people. Now, across the Caribbean, we have around 40-odd million people. Imagine if we took in a weighted way, that is according to what people can afford, whatever the number of dollars is, we have 40 million people. Let's say we could get one dollar from three quarters of those people a day. You're talking about 30 million dollars a day across the Caribbean. What couldn't we do with that? And so I think we need to look inwardly at ourselves now, we have many programs, we call it ASU in the Bahamas, where people literally put in monies on a weekly basis, and they go ahead and do marvelous things in a consumer sense. Now, we imagine if we could put that together in the private sector, and what couldn't happen in terms of Caribbean self-help as a group, self-help, not waiting for somebody else to say, please help the poor. Thank you. Thank you. There was a question right. Hi, my, Sir Sonny. My name is Kia Penso. My question is, looking back at your, uh, the Commonwealth mobilization against apartheid, which was, it was funny, it was in one country, but it became really a global mobilization, and it was not just an issue of one country. I mean, eventually, that's how it sort of evolved. And so I wonder if you think the Commonwealth is capable of that kind of mobilization now, and where would, that, where would, where would you apply that? Where so would you start a movement? What would, you, what would it be for? What would be the next move? Well, the... Rhodesia has become Zimbabwe. South Africa is free. Those are battles past. There is no equal of them on the agenda now. There are other issues, other battles. But the lesson of that era is that the Commonwealth and I think the world was pleased that there was a commonwealth that had within it the capacity to influence events in Rhodesia and in South Africa. The commonwealth has to be ready to take on those challenges wherever they arise, and not, as it were, to withdraw from the field of of battle uh, and rest on, on its laurels and its record. They're, they were, it's a great record, but the Commonwealth has to renew itself continuously. And it has to renew itself within the context of the international community, which was why I read that passage from von Weizsäcker, that the world would like to see the Commonwealth as an asset to global action, not the Commonwealth as a club doing its own thing, but assisting the international process. There, there was a wonderful little endorsement of the book by Kofi Annan in which he was making that point, that the Commonwealth seeing itself as an instrument of internationalism is a great asset to the world community. And that will constantly be my, my take on, the, on that issue. Could I just say how pleased I was to hear the comments from the Bahamas? Because part of the problem of the Caribbean is that we tend to think of the Caribbean Sea as a dividing sea without reflecting on the fact that the Bahamas is a unified country of how many islands, Ambassador? More than 700. 
700. 700 islands constitute the Bahamas, which is a unity in itself, despite the dividing sea. And there is a lesson that the Bahamas can give to the rest of the Caribbean. My complaint sometimes is that the Bahamas rests on its achievements and doesn't chastise its neighbors enough into learning from that example how an archipelago can come together into a unity. So thank you. Thank you very much. We have two more questions, one on the left, one on the right, quite balanced, but the lady first. Firstly, thank you so very much, Sir Ramphal. Thank you so much for your work, and I implore you to continue to work with us as we move towards Caribbean integration. Beyond Ambassador Ramding's question about our current state of integration, what do you offer in terms of opinion in light of the CSME that's already in place and trying to move forward? What would you say with light of that? It's about a, the single market and economy, whether that part of the integration process, how we can move that further. Are you asking how we can use the market economy to, to drive our individual island economies or the market economy? place in the CSME to bring us together? Despite well, the, the whole, there are others here better qualified, Chandra Hardy, who has been through all this in the World Bank. That is the whole theology of integration. How can we use the principles, the practices of, of a market economy on a larger scale so that we help each other. I give you a, a practical uh, example. A few years ago, Guyana was hosting a heads of government meeting. CARICOM heads of government meeting. And President Jagdeo said to me in conversation before the meeting, what were your thoughts on the agenda and so on? I said, I kind of stopped him. I said, President, there is one thing I would like to urge you to do. And that is nothing to do with the agenda. I would like you to take your fellow heads of government around this town to its public markets and show them the abundance of food that is available and is thrown away before you sit down to talk about a program of food security. That is what I mean. That is integration. We talk about food security in the Caribbean, and the Caribbean has an abundance of food. What it does not have is a capacity to make that food available. Instead, supermarkets everywhere, and there's not common to any one place. I live in Barbados, it's there. It is so in Trinidad. It is so in Jamaica. They order the same food from Miami. And it comes in refrigerated containers to, the, to our islands, who then throw away the food that we produce. Now, until we can deal with practical issues of that kind, how are we going to make a reality of integration. Thank you very much. 
Uh, there is another two questions, but before we go there, you raised an issue which is of hemispheric interest today, especially in this moment where we are heading towards the next summit of the Americas with the political leaders. You were you played a key role in the re the strengthening of relations with Cuba and CARICOM. In the context of what is happening today in terms of having Cuba back around the table of the inter-American system, what's your view on that? Uh, as you can reflect a little bit on what was the relationship between CARICOM before and since then it was re-established. You mean with Cuba? With Cuba. Well, of course, I think Cuba should be for our West Indians uh, a memory of pride. We took on the United States. We took on much of the hemisphere in establishing diplomatic relations with Cuba. In 1972. And we did it and succeeded in doing it because we did it together. It wasn't just Guyana. It was Guyana and Jamaica and Barbados and Trinidad, all together, saying, we are going to establish diplomatic relations with Cuba. Finish. What happened? It broke, it ended the hemispheric diplomatic isolation of Cuba. We must do so again. We did it as a matter of principle. There were some who were close to Cuba ideologically. There were some who were not close to Cuba ideologically. But everyone was united in the single fact that Cuba was a part of the Caribbean and had to be a part of Caribbean arrangements. That we must not allow ourselves to be dictated to by other forces who for their own reasons uh, might want to isolate Cuba. We don't have to agree with what Cuba's philosophy of government is. We have to recognize its right to independent existence. And I think that must remain with us. Cuba must continue to, it was part of, it was part of our problem with Kissinger's proposals at Tlatelolco. We could not engage uh, without Cuba. And we have tried. The, the Caribbean was valiant in involving Cuba in ACP relations. Uh, the Cubans have never forgotten that. Uh, and so we have to persist. Um, I hope we are not faint-hearted. Thank you very much. Questions? Good morning, Mr. Ramsaran. My name is Ashok Ramsaran. We share a common uh, heritage. I was also born in Letterkenny. Uh, you mentioned that politics and profits uh, overwhelm principles, pragmatism, professionalism. And failed leadership can, uh, contributed to many of the demise in the Caribbean regions of smaller countries. Do you think that lack of a common pain, a common agenda, a common problem can lead to uh, complacency that contribute to a lack of proper agenda to, for change? I'm, I'm not sure I, I've got you correctly. Uh, do I believe that the normally, if there is pain, there is action that leads to change? Do you think that the lack of pain will you have uh, all these amenities that are flown in from everywhere in the world, which you mentioned, from Miami to Barbados, and the flat world which we live in, sharing common information throughout, and a new generation on the internet? Do you think that we have? in the Caribbean, in the small countries especially, neglected to look at a common agenda of, of problems? 
Well, I, I think there, I think Caribbean people recognize that their future lies beyond their islands, and for this purpose I regard Guyana and Belize as islands, and they have a choice. The choice is to make it happen at home or to leave home. And sadly, in droves, they are making the latter choice. They are giving up on local leadership and they are leaving. What are the proportions? 60, 70 percent of our graduates leave the Caribbean, leave the shores of UWI. The Chancellor is here. He says it every year in his graduation exhortations. We are educating people, West Indians, at high levels for overseas, for beyond. We have to do more at the level of leadership to convince those young people that their future lies better with remaining at home and contributing. Because we can't achieve those aims of integration, those gains of integration, without that educated class that remain and make it happen. So we, we are, some people say we are at the crossroads. We are, we are very much in the crossroads. We, we, are, we are heading towards a cliff. And too many of us are going over. Thank you very much. Before I go to the next uh, uh, person who will ask you a question, the point you're making about those educated leave the region, migrate, I wanted to inform everybody here and yourself that next December, every year we have a youth conference of the Americas. And this year, the conference will focus specifically on that aspect I'm very about glad education about. and migration. Very good. How important it is to keep the educated people at home and to facilitate a good living for them as well. So this is recognized as a critical issue, as you have pointed out, not only for the and Caribbean, but also for the whole hemisphere. Sir. Um, I will be piggybacking Can on Can you speak what? a bit louder Sorry. in the microphone? Yes. Um, I'm going to try and say this in a nice way. The Caribbean seem to have a tendency to replace one slave master for the next in our foreign policy, in our directives. I'm an example of a young person who finds there's greater opportunity outside of home than in home. And a simple example might be when a friend told me it's cheaper for her to fly from Jamaica to Miami to Antigua than to fly from Jamaica to Antigua. In simple other examples, even traveling among the OECS, regional governments tax so high to travel regionally that it undermines the ability to do business within the Caribbean hemisphere, thereby undermining young people from having a business mindset regionally because it's cheaper for a lot of us to travel to the U.S. to do business with the U.S. I think it is wonderful when everybody has a lot of ideas, a lot of talk. The problem is with the Caribbean, we are short-minded in our vision on what we are trying to do. And at times, any time one island finds an economic opportunity, all the others are clamoring to undermine and draw to the same conclusion. Or I find sometimes, as states, we compete too much against each other. 
instead of drawing together and growing together. It is so sad that every year I keep asking, is there something for me to go back to? And the forefathers who fought for independence always tell me the same thing. There's nothing for you back home. And as a Caribbean person, that is very saddening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, Sridhar, would you like to come in? No, you have described reality. What I would urge is that you speak up more within the Caribbean itself. That faced with that choice, you don't just pack up and leave, but you try to create a mindset within your own countries that is reformist, that is for change, that is for opting against taking the path of opportunity abroad. Trudad, my name is Wesley Quicken. Sport has been a unifying influence globally and uh, in the Caribbean West Indies cricket has been one of the success stories of a regional approach to life. What is your view on the current state of West Indies cricket? <laughs> it's a very sensitive topic, but relevant. So, so Shira. Well, I can answer in one word, that is ashamed. I am ashamed of the state of West Indian cricket. I'm ashamed of the action taken by the players in India. I'm ashamed of the action taken by the board in relation to, to those situations. Uh, it, it is a terrible state, and I speak for, as an insider. Had the Caribbean implemented P.J. Patterson's report nearly 10 years ago, we wouldn't be in this mess now. But the board sidelined it, and everyone ignored it. Now, the situation is much worse. There was a stage when I was asked to be a mediator about five years ago, the first breakdown between the board and the players. I did my utmost. It was sabotaged by the board and by the chairman at that time. There are people here who know that. And on, on, until we can bring the situation under control, bring it to heel, cleanse the board, remove these factors of politics within the cricket, not politics, politics, but the politics of territorial boards, uh, negotiating with the central board for special favorites for members, for players of countries. We've got to change those ways. If we don't do it, our cricket will go to hell. And the, the, if you ask me what action should be taken, I think West Indians should speak out. I'm, I'm not hearing, apart from the, the, a few columnists who spoke and wrote at the time, I'm not hearing any great hue and cry from West Indians about it. It is almost as if they have accepted. So, ashamed? Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very pleased with the clarity with which you conveyed a message of the need for action and the need to do something about it rather than continue talking about it. We'll take the last question. I believe we have one person, Ms. Diane. That is Diane. And then um, there will be an opportunity to, if you have not purchased the book as yet, to purchase the book. And then Sashridhar has made himself available to sign some copies uh, outside uh, in the hall of the uh, uh, heroes. There is. Good morning, Sushweda. My name is Doris Dean, and I question a couple. I have a couple of questions. One, 
the current parliamentary system in the Caribbean, there has been some dispute or some debate that it is not serving the Caribbean and it may not be what is best for the Caribbean. I'd like to get your comment on that. I'd also like to get your comment on the suggestion that the Caribbean financial system is based so much or so heavily on taxing that it is eroding the strength of the Caribbean. My final question is what in all of your achievements would you consider your greatest contribution to Guyana, the region, and to the world? Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Those are three questions. It was not the last question. Um, three questions, and the last question was indeed also my own question for the end, your own reflections on what has been the most critical element of your life as uh, international diplomat. But first on Caribbean parliamentarians, Richard. Well, if I could take the last element of your last question, it really must be for others to say what achievement, any achievement. I would say that for myself, the greatest satisfaction was in the struggle for freedom in Southern Africa. Uh, it was the greatest challenge that I faced in my international life, my global life, uh, and we succeeded. The, the, the Commonwealth and the Caribbean within it, as a very powerful element within it, contributed greatly to the ending of UDI in Rhodesia, to the creation of a free Zimbabwe, with whom we were subsequently to have problems, but of a free Zimbabwe, and certainly to the end of apartheid in South Africa. And for the latter, there could be no better testimony than Mandela's itself. That was the work with which I had the greatest satisfaction. The other lay within the hemisphere and within the region. In those moments when the region came together, there were moments like that. There were great moments. When I was actually engaged in drafting the federal constitution, there could be no greater moment. Alas, it never saw the light of day for political reasons. But that did not take away the satisfaction of how near we came. I just pray that we can get back there again soon. Thank you very much. We close the session now. And uh, again, uh, I want to thank Sushrida Ramphal for being available and responding to the questions and observations uh, made in s with such clarity, but also very action-oriented, with a clear mandate, with a clear message to politicians, young people, as well as diplomats present here. Thank you very much, Sushridat. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all. <laughs>